year. I would say she would prefer to go to girls' games last year. Then you start getting women who become, and this is one of the problems, good and bad things about the women's movement, good in that women are setting new examples and breaking through glass windows, bad that they have to be, it's so hard for them to do this. Um, one is Sally Ride. Who is Sally Ride? First woman in space, right? And now having a woman in space isn't that big of a deal. Yeah, it's a great name. And the thing is, and what people are really like this are saying is, this isn't great for the women's movement, but what will be even better is when an astronaut goes up who's female and it's not a big deal, right? Because today women get astronauts go up all the time and it's not a big thing because it's normal now, right? Um, that's important. Um, what the first black coach in um, the SEC said was, me being hired isn't a big deal. Me being fired is a big deal because if I ever get fired for not doing my job, that means that I'm an equal, right? If, I, if, if I'm treated the same as everybody else, then I'm, everyone's equal. Who was the, who was the, I think it was Nolan Richardson who said that. Um, I might be wrong. He was the first black coach in the SEC. I don't know if he said that. I'm pretty sure he may have said that. Um, but it might also have been um, Romeo Cornell, or um, Sylvester Cornell. Um, yeah, he might have said that. I can't remember which one it was. He was a great guy. Yeah. Actually, 30 for 30s made something up. Oh, SEC Stories made something up of all those guys. Um, who was Geraldine Ferraro? Geraldine Ferraro was picked to be the vice presidential nominee in 1984. She was the first ever female to be on a presidential ticket. In 1984? 84, yeah. Um, and while she's still alive, in fact, when Hillary was running in 08 in the primaries, um, a couple times she called foul on some of the things the Obama administration and other, other not other administration, the Obama campaign and some other campaigns were doing, um, like gender baiting and stuff. She's sort of seen as a lion, right, of the feminist movement. But there are other, Hillary Clinton is a huge one, and I have it, they're not all on here, but um, why is Nancy Pelosi important? First Speaker of the House. She was the highest ranked person in the legislative branch. That's a really big deal. That's the biggest branch. Um, Hillary Clinton was the first ever female to win a primary. She won a bunch of them. Um, Who was the first ever female Secretary of State? Does anyone know? She was great. Her name was Madeleine Albright. Madeleine Albright. Um, Madeleine Albright's father, I, she's, I see, she's actually originally from um, Czechoslovakia or Romania? I think Czechoslovakia. Um, her dad was a professor and actually at the University of Denver, you know who, and it turned out was his all time favorite student at the University of Denver? Her name was Condoleezza Rice. Condoleezza Rice graduated from college when she was 19 and was um, Madeleine Albright's all-time favorite student. And when she found out, when Madeleine Albright found out that the student who was brilliant and young and political and African-American was Republican, she was so sad. <laughs> uh, she wrote a really Good book. In fact, her, she wrote a book called Madam Secretary. And Mel Albright actually has signed the book. I have her signature in the book. It's really cool. It's a great book. And she talked about she talked about this, and she was literally really sad that this woman, who was going to be a political force, you know, gorgeous and just and brilliant and African American and so politically astute, was a Republican and pretty conservative Republican. Um, Condoleezza Rice, if you're curious, um, she was the first ever black female to be Secretary of State. She was the first ever female national security advisor. She also, and this is the most ridiculous thing, you think 19 graduating college is ridiculous? She was a tenured professor at Stanford at 26. Oh, that's silly. That's that, that is silly. You shouldn't even be done with your PhD when you're 26. And Stanford's never going to hire you out of graduate school. And you have to take several years before you can get tenure. But not for her. She was just, she's really smart. Um, she's really smart. She's also a concert level pianist. And you know what her all time favorite 
jobs she wants to do in the world. Commissioner of the NFL. Oh, yes. Loves the NFL. Yeah. Or make crazy money doing that. Yeah. Yeah, you think Roger Goodell's tough. Right. <laughs> You're talking back to me? James Harrison? Yeah. Um, the women and African Americans aren't the only minorities who are pushing and striving for rights in the 1960s. Um, Latinos are also doing it, specifically um, immigrants coming from Mexico who are um, agricultural workers in California. Um, Cesar Chavez um, is sort of an amazing American success story. He was able to organize the, uh, you can see the United Farm Workers, he was able to organize immigrant farm worker uh, migrants. How hard is that? You know how hard it is to organize migrant people and how much they don't want to organize when they're illegal immigrants because they're scared to be sent back, right? Um, and he did because people were being paid literally almost slave wages, right, um, in these farms. And what they do in California is because California is so long, the, se the picking seasons change. And they just go down the state um, and go into different farms and picking, and they were, they were being paid horribly and treated horribly. And families were moving around, and kids couldn't stay in school, and it was hard on families. And so what happens is, generationally speaking, the next families have a hard time. And he was able to organize them. The United Farm Workers really helped set a, a basis for the Latin American community in California. And today, are Latin Americans politically powerful? Yes. They're becoming more and more increasingly, in fact, today, um, Latino Americans are the largest minority group. There are more Latino Americans than there are African Americans, and Latino Americans now make more money on average per person than African Americans do. Um, I think I'm right on that. I read something last night in um, Foreign Affairs magazine, and, I'm, and that was what was quoted, and I'm pretty sure he's right. Um, Well, I think that the, the level of discrimination and the level of um, historical um, segregation, I don't think Latinos had to deal with for as long. And I, honestly, I think your average racist dude sees Hispanics a little differently than black people. Um, for a lot of Americans, and a lot of white Americans uh, who are Catholic, a lot of Hispanics are Catholic, most Hispanics are Catholic, and so there's, a cult, there's already a, a connection there. I don't know what it is. Um, but his, there's just such different histories, and maybe that's part of it. I'm not sure, but yeah. But but <laughs> Asians have been here even less time, and they make more than white people do. Yeah. Oh, maybe it's cultural. I mean, it's part of like you know the whole like lazy American culture as compared to the. Maybe I think part of it is um, maybe also in a lot of areas that African Americans have become through historical realities more of an urban culture, and then they've been pushed into sort of de facto segregation. And there are definitely Hispanics there, but Hispanics aren't as focused just on urban areas, and so they maybe had some more. I don't know. I don't know about it to really comment intellectually. Um, Native Americans are also pushing for the rights. In fact, uh, one of the most interesting things is. Um, you know what Alcatraz is, right? Um, Alcatraz, Alcatraz was only a prison for a while. It wasn't a prison forever and ever and ever. And it, had, it has been out of use for 40-something years, yeah. Um, has anyone gone to Alcatraz before? I want to go this summer. Are you really? Um, Kelly and I went to San Francisco on our honeymoon. We went over there. It's, it's a really pretty place. Um, Alcatraz is gorgeous. Wasn't it original? Yeah. No, it's, if it was, that's ridiculous. I mean, literally, it's a little rock out of nowhere. Uh, I think it was. I, don't know, was I, I read something that, like. Oh, was it really? Yeah. yeah okay, it maybe it was. Like it's, a small fort. If you see naval bases now, it's it's a really small island. Yeah, not a, you can literally a swim to it. I mean, not like, you have to be a pretty good swimmer. Um, they actually have races the, at the Alcatraz Triathlon where you start at Alcatraz and you swim all the way into San Francisco and then you bike and run. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Why do you like well, when you're in the water, you're not like. Oh. <laughs> no, not, 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 you're like, not, stop kicking like me! Wait, not like, like San Francisco, not like the water park. Yeah, no, San Francisco from there is gorgeous. San Francisco is a gorgeous town. It's really expensive. Um, but, so Native American, I forget what tribe it was, but they actually took Alcatraz hostage. Like, no one was there, but they occupied Alcatraz Island for months. 
and they do what? They vandalized it too. Well, and they um, they were trying to get notoriety for what they were protesting, the treatment of Native Americans. Native Americans today are still have the highest poverty level, the highest homicide rate, the highest suicide rate, uh, the lowest education rate, the lowest literacy rate in America. Like, oh, I don't know. Um, it's a very small, like, um, one or two percent, maybe max. I mean, it's probably less than that. I'm not sure. We had a full blood Native American in our school. She was Northern Cheyenne. I tell you about her. She was Sarah Beach. Yeah, her name. She was great. Um, her, she lived on a reservation, and she lived here. And I, I met her mom. Um, they ended up moving back, but she was just. First of all, she's gorgeous. I mean, she's like almost six foot and she's had real straight, long black hair. Very, very modest girl, really smart. Um, and it was really funny. She had grown up with very little. I mean, she's very modest and just never asked for much. And she came here, and obviously, Lawrenceburg's not like the height of, you know, entitlement, right? I mean, we got plenty of poor kids here, and just the stuff the kids were complaining about. She had a hard time with it. Um, she had grown up with nothing and never asked for anything. And they ended up moving back to the reservation. Um, yeah. Our, our family is like. Let the man speak first, man. <laughs> I interrupted. Our family is like the definition of assimilated Native American. Yeah. So, how much Native American are you? I'm a quarter. My dad's 50%. My grandma's actually full blood. Oh, wow. And my, my grandma oh. thinks she was black. Like, you know, like, <laughs> you, she doesn't. You, she, you don't think she's Native American at all. Like, you would not think about that. <laughs> You would think of black. Like, the other day I was on Infinite Campus looking at something and I saw it say, it said self identified Native American for years. And I was like, yeah. maybe he just self identified to be funny or really is he Native American? Because yeah. I used to write down that. Uh, she's, she never met her mother or father. But like, my dad, well, like, we go to, you know, the Native American Flute Festival we have in October here? But, like uh, our friend, our friend, friend Fred Kings, he's, he's a Native American. He's like fifty percent all of. But um, when we were there, Dad, as like Dad and I, were like a few of the people there that had a lot of, of Native American in us, and we were like, oh, he's he's fifty percent Cherokee. And everyone was like, wow, that's great. You know, and then like people come up to us and be like, okay, well let's sing the uh, Cherokee greeting song. You know, we're like. <laughs> Yeah, we're <laughs> like it was, it was crazy to see how much more people knew about that culture and it had so much less to do with it. Yeah, a lot of it. I'll tell you, that's that's really interesting you say that. And as as you get older, and you start looking for one of the things that I've always been kind of depressed about, and I bet some of you might get like this, is that if, when you're a historian and you spend your whole life analyzing crap, you stop feel like you're a part of something, right? Someone's like, oh, why are these people saying this? These people saying this? Can't they analyze this? But then I'm kind of jealous. I'm like, at least they have something that they feel like they're a part of, right? Because I'm always trying to step back and analyze things more intellectually. But then on some level, you're just a dude who doesn't have anything to hold on to, right? And that was sort of like, because our family's real Irish Catholic, and, and you know, there's so many just stupid things we do and rules and traditions are just ignorant, right? And the Catholic Church has a crap ton of stupid things. <laughs> just kidding. Hope. <laughs> um, um, the, but you're like, you know what? It's something. Kind of like Native American stuff. You just sort of want to have a touch yeah. something. I'd say, I'd say my grandma, she wasn't, you know, like, her, her, her mom died during birth and her father put her for adoption. So I'd say if she had more, like, family ties. Right. Like, Connection to it. But, yeah. But her, but her grandpa, but her uh, adopted mother was, like, an early feminist. Oh, wow. Well, I was wondering, though, because you have facial hair. A lot of Native Americans can't grow facial hair. Yeah. Well, like, apparently my dad, like, he's really hairy. But apparently, like, he couldn't grow hair until he was, like, 30. There was a guy who used to do triathlons, and I was lifting this him one day. I was like, oh, wow, because some triathletes shave their legs. It's like, oh, you shave your legs? You must be really into it. He's like, no, I'm actually half Native American. I can't grow facial hair. I can't grow any of my hair on my legs. Yeah. I was like, you lucky. Yeah, that's actually, I'm actually pretty hairy, but I don't have, like, that much hair. Um, well, before we get going, let's talk about. <laughs> let's finish. 
let's finish um, Johnson's legacy, okay? Um, and then we can start with uh, start with the Vietnam War. What can we say about Johnson? Before we get into the Vietnam thing, because the Vietnam, you're thinking, wow, Johnson, all these civil rights, all these changes, right? Things are great. This is a president whose domestic legacy and whose foreign policy legacy are just wildly different. Um, so domestically speaking, what can we say about Johnson? Highly progressive, right? The Great Society really only comes in second to the New Deal when it comes to reshaping American liberalism and government action. What's happened to the poverty rate? Down. It's going down. He literally tried to solve poverty. I mean, this is, this is a huge thing. And, and while poverty didn't go away, things like Head Start programs and um, uh, student loans and Medicare and Medicaid and PBS, National Endowment for the Arts, and all these things are supposed to enrich your life. Um, food for the poor. I think, I think this is when um, uh, free lunches came around for students. Um, what do you think was some criticisms of the Great Society? Yeah, this is called social engineering, right? We're trying to engineer how society is shaped rather than just letting things fall where they may. Well, like in capitalism, Andrew will tell you that if you're a winner, you're a winner. If you're a loser, you're a loser. And that's the way it's going to be. And if you don't win, then keep your mouth shut. And if you do win, then whatever. Why can't everyone be winners? Well, that's what I understand. Yeah. Because we don't live in a socialistic society, man. Uh, Mary won. And this is oftentimes you hear people get really mad because. Um, James Tom. Um, because uh, have you seen, like, every time. Like, my son has done a bunch of sports, and at the end of every season, he gets a trophy. And a bunch of people are like, why does everybody have to get a trophy? If you, if you win, you get a trophy. If you don't win... It's fair. Why well, do you care about sports? It's sports to me is not fair. But you can also make the argument that sports are a representative of society, right? They get you ready for success. Yeah, and my son's like, I got four trophies. I'm like, 